As a fresh graduate in 2012, I was very excited to find out that I had been accepted for an internship at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons here in The Hague. At the time, I didn't have as much knowledge about the UN as I do today. So I was expecting this high-tech, matrix-like building with screens flashing across the walls. So imagine my surprise when I was shown to my desktop computer to find Windows 1995 and Lotus Notes. And then a few months ago, I was working in the United Nations Relief and Works Agency in Jordan. Safe to say that by now, my expectations were significantly less. But I was pleasantly surprised to find Windows Vista. I saw this as a big improvement, but there's still a long way to go. We are all very well aware of the rapid proliferation of technology, and it's very difficult to keep ahead of the game, even on an individual level. But there are many advantages for the UN to keep abreast and provide staff with the most recent technologies so that they can fulfill their roles more efficiently and projects can be completed within a shorter time frame. And of course, there is social media, which needs to be further embraced so that the UN can appeal to a wider audience. And I don't necessarily mean that Ban Ki-moon needs to post duck face selfies on Instagram. Actually, that might help. But to just utilize all the different platforms available online to create a better global understanding of worldwide issues that affect us all and engage more youth and ordinary citizens. Technology is the future. And we also need to bear in mind that with the many benefits that come with it, there are also many risks involved. War is changing. And ISIS is the perfect example of an army that has used communications technology and social media to further its cause, but also change the lives of impressionable youth all over the world. That too by just a few tweets. It's as if ISIS is this geeky teenage computer whiz kid, and the UN is the grandfather who thinks that Apple is still just a fruit. But states are also in danger, not just from these kind of groups and individuals, but from other states who can gain intelligence and potentially collapse infrastructure. Cyber espionage and cyber attacks need to be seen as potential threats to international peace and security. And the UN Charter needs to overtly reflect this. War is changing. Our information, our identities, behaviors, habits, this is all data that's becoming increasingly valuable, and not just to advertisers and marketers. Think about how this information can affect you were it to fall into the wrong hands. Cyberspace is a whole new battleground, and we do not yet have the basic weaponry to defend ourselves, nor to fight. The UN needs to keep up to date and also create international standards for appropriate behavior in cyberspace. One of the many admirable targets of the ninth Sustainable Development Goal is to provide less developed states with basic information and communications infrastructure. This is all well and good, but we also need to equip these states and give them the knowledge in how to defend themselves were they to ever be the victim of a cyber attack. Otherwise, we're setting them up for failure. Like the World Health Organization, there should be a UN body which promotes international technological safety and security, 
which sets norms, sets the standards, and provides leadership and technical support. The international community would greatly benefit from this. Because like a disease, a cyber attack surpasses borders, does not discriminate between its victims, and blame cannot always be appropriated to a responsible individual or group. The UN really has the potential here to be a world leader in this area and facilitate international cooperation on issues of cyber warfare. As we've seen in the recent tensions between the United States and China, this is much needed. However, the UN cannot do this with Windows 1995. Thank you.